Creating your own reality. Is it possible for me? I am Jennifer K. Hill, the Consciousness Architect, and I am here to tell you that it's not only possible, it's closer than you might think. Welcome to the show. Hello, friends, and thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Regarding Consciousness. It is always our joy and our pleasure to bring you some of the greatest wisdom keepers, thought leaders, scientists, and authors from around the world to share their thoughts and their wisdom and insights on consciousness. Today, we have a special episode focusing on spirituality and resilience and how the two tie together and what that all has to do with consciousness. I'm grateful to have a wonderful thought leader who I had the privilege of first interviewing a few years ago when we were joining the Coalition for Global Unity, and that is Miranda McPherson. Miranda is a brilliant thought leader and author who is a spiritual teacher and interfaith minister who shares a feminine approach to surrender and non-dual realization based on the practice that she calls ego relaxation. Her wisdom and palpable transmission invites others to become more graceful human beings through inquiry, meditation, devotion, and psychological integration. Grounded in extensive study in the world's wisdom tradition and inspired by Sri Ramanana Maharishi, A Course in Miracles and the Diamond Approach, Miranda has been guiding others into direct experiences of the sacred for over 30 years. In her 20s, she founded the One Spirit Interfaith Foundation in London, where she trained and ordained 600 ministers and counselors. And today, Miranda leads the Living Grace Global Sangha and offers retreats internationally and serves as core faculty with the Shift Network and advisor to the Association for Spiritual Integrity. She has written books including The Way of Grace, The Transforming Power of Ego Relaxation, Meditations on Boundless Love, and Cultivating Grace Card Decks, as well as many more. Branda, it's wonderful to be back with you again. How are you? Yeah, great, Jennifer. It's good to be here with you, too. Yeah, so it's, it's such a beautiful time for us to reconnect. When we first had connected, I believe it was around 2020, when the world was at a very interesting shifting point for all of us as human beings as we learned how to be with ourselves and with our loved ones. And now again, I feel like we're being called together as leaders and spiritual teachers to come together and to support ourselves most importantly and one another with access to spiritual resilience. Tell us a little bit about what that means to you. I think resilience is a a term that isn't just about learning how to survive, but it's about learning how to thrive. And what we know is that just having a spiritual practice, a real spiritual practice, meaning some kind of way that we tune in and immerse ourselves in a consciousness that isn't just egoic, isn't just coming from separation, isn't just our thoughts and our feelings. Anytime we immerse ourselves in divine presence or what we might call God or our spiritual nature, that by definition makes us more resilient emotionally and practically and psychologically. We know that. Research has shown that having a spiritual practice is one of the things that helps us most on every level, even it helps us with longevity. But when I say spiritual resilience, what I mean is the capacity also to retain our optimism, even when things look really bad, that helps us to remember that even though we're dealing with some things that are very troubling in our world, wherever you live on the world, There are very complex and challenging issues that affect us personally and that affect us socially and that affect us collectively and that are really going to invite all of us to rise into our noble qualities 
rather than a lot of what we've seen recently, which is people getting activated into their more primitive tendencies and reacting instinctually, there's a great need for more of us to rise into our higher nature at this time. And that's difficult when things are intense and stressful. And so I think that having a strong spiritual practice, not just a strong faith, but an actual practice, ways that we connect deeply and immerse our consciousness in the rejuvenation that comes from prayer and meditation and inquiry and what brings us back to our own spiritual depth is super important. And it's also a way that we can help because every single one of us in the course of just living our lives, we affect other people just through our presence. And I'm sure those of you who are listening in your heart of hearts, you're listening to this because you want to be a force for good in some way. You want to help in some way. You want to inject more love and truth into our society. And we can. I want to pull back on what you just said there and go a little bit deeper, Miranda, around this idea of inquiry and curiosity. I was recently at a mastermind group, and one of the women who was facilitating uh, one of the breakouts at the mastermind did a fascinating exercise where she paired us together, and she had us listen to our partners from different stances. For example, in one stance, is it was with receptivity and openness. And another stance was from needing to fix the person that we were listening to and so on and so forth. And you get the idea of how it went. And so I'd love to know, Miranda, how can we come from inquiry rather than fixed ways of being? Because I think inquiry ties into emotional resilience, emotional flexibility, as well as the spiritual resilience. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. The word inquiry is used by a lot of people, and inquiry is a very big part of what I teach. So what this other teacher, how she used that word and how I use that word might not be the same thing. But inquiry goes back to Socrates. And so it's really about opening your consciousness using questions, but Inquiry isn't really just using questions and curiosity. It's, in the way I teach it, it's about really entering into deeper dimensions of consciousness. And that requires that we have an openness in our attitude. It requires that we don't just hold on to what we think we know, that we're really willing to keep learning and growing and even question the foundations of what we take to be reality And I want to segue back to why I think this is really important, because when it comes to nurturing spiritual resilience, where I feel we need to begin is to ground ourselves in grace. And when I say grace, I don't just mean a beautiful, lofty state of gratitude. When you really look very deeply at existence itself, when you look at nature, especially nature where things haven't been manipulated, not necessarily curated into a garden, but just how things really are, when human minds haven't been messing with it, you see there's a profound power and an intelligence to the way things naturally are that can really remind us of what we are too, because we are also part of nature. So what if Nature, the way we experience it, is just the tip of the iceberg of a ground of reality that is so profoundly intelligent, so loving, so powerful, and that how we can begin to become more resilient and clear and open and curious and wise, all the things that we know are good, is we need to ground ourselves in that depth. So the question is, what is our relationship with that ground of our being? Whether you want to use the language grace, the ground of our being, God, true nature, almost it doesn't matter. But what does matter is what is your experience so far of that deeper ground of everything and how much access do you have to that experientially? so that you can relax back into that as your refuge 
as your reset and as the foundation to then be with complex questions and issues that are personal and collective. Issues, how do I navigate this tricky spot in my marriage? Or what is the wisest next step in this complicated situation I find myself in on my medical journey? Or what's the very best use of my life force and my time at this point in my life? Or how can I make the most meaningful difference to my community? So these are really important questions that are questions that anyone who's sincere, sincerely wants to evolve, sincerely wants to help, sincerely wants to live a real spiritual life, wants to be asking. And we can't ask them superficially. We have to have to have a foundation to be with that. So inquiry is a way to be with things deeply and let the wisdom that we need emerge. Let's imagine that some of the people right now listening or watching this episode are struggling with this. The call I had immediately prior to this was a dear friend who is having a spiritual awakening, and she's decided that she's chosen, I want to shift that word, she's chosen to devote this time to her healing and to not doing and accomplishing so much Yet the pattern that she found herself in, she's a deeply thoughtful person, is she finds herself now attracted to things like TikTok. So, for example, she's not, instead of working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, she's giving herself permission to have downtime, and yet she's finding herself distracted. How can we find ourselves, Miranda, give ourselves the grace to pull back in that word? To be in this state of inquiry without allowing all of the other noise to fill up. Yeah. Let's shift the word state of inquiry because I'm not in alignment with you there. Inquiry isn't a state, it's a practice. Okay. Um, Obviously, we have conflicts, all of us. When there's resistance showing up in a person's life to actually dropping deeper, and usually resistance shows up, it's curious because why would we resist what we say we want? But most people do experience great resistance to actually giving themselves space and time to be still, to step back from the doing and the stimulation so that they can listen and deepen. And so usually that has to do with some kind of fear. Mm. So if we were to bring curiosity to the fear, what might I be afraid of? Like, what is my fear of turning more substantially within? So this actually is an inquiry question that I give my students from time to time. Tell me a fear you have of dropping more substantially within and letting go. And usually the fears that come up for everyone are some variations of, I might not be in control, or I might get in touch with something that I fear might overwhelm me, or that I might be asked to let go of something I'm attached to. Or I might disappear. The, my familiar way of knowing myself might disappear. All of those things are actually likely. Because real spiritual deepening is not about having a better version of yourself. It is about dissolving your identity as a personality, as an ego self, as a, think, as a person that thinks it's separate that thinks it's not good enough, that is trying to grab hold of some spiritual principles but actually not allow any dissolving of some of the fundamental misunderstandings to happen. And so what we have to do is to learn to trust that our fundamental nature is still what it has always been. Like when you and I hold a newborn baby in our arms, and maybe those of you who are listening, maybe you've actually given birth or you've held, you've been around newborns, so you know 
what that's like. When you hold a newborn in your arms, the natural response isn't, they're not worth that much. They haven't written any books yet. They haven't got a PhD yet. They can't do anything for themselves. They're not worth that much. The natural response from our heart is one of absolute awe, is wow, because we see the inherent value and meaning and majesty of a naked human being. We see the truth of that. And so what's really, what we need to trust as we're turning more substantially within and perhaps hitting fears that we even don't understand, is we have to trust that our fundamental nature is still that primordial purity because it comes from God. We are all souls of the divine, not just from, but our very being is made up of divine being. And if we would be willing to just trust that, even though that might not yet be our emotional reality, if we were to be willing to trust that, we could be a lot less afraid of actually saying, I'm going to come to my meditation cushion for 20 minutes and I'm going to do that at 8 a.m. before I pick up anything on my cell phone. I'm going to prioritize some quiet time to just marinate in the grace of being. Or I'm going to be with God. I'm going to be with capital S self and make that my number one priority. Because if that, if we do that, if we're willing to do that, I guarantee you so much good is going to come spontaneously because that's the well where the innate noble qualities of our spiritual depth can have the chance to bubble up. Ramana Maharshi, a great Indian sage who has inspired me very deeply, he used to say, grace is always present. He said, you think of it as something that has to descend from on high, but he says, really, it's inside you, it's in your heart. And he said, whenever the mind subsides back into its source, which is to say, whenever the mind quiets down and drops into the mind, into the heart, grace rushes forth, sprouting as if a spring from within you. And so even just as I'm saying this, perhaps you get a feeling of the nourishment that can come by the commitment to give ourselves space and time in a culture that is so on and dispersing. And I think on a practical level, one of the things that is going to require from us is some consciousness, to use your word, <laughs> and some awareness of having some boundaries with these devices that we're all using. For example, I know even how it is for me, and I'm someone who is a spiritual teacher, has been teaching people to have a spiritual practice. I am a deep meditator, have been for four decades of my life. And the hypnotic pull of that device is a very strong one. And I'm someone that keeps my phone on my charging device overnight. And I've trained myself to not look at it until I've had my spiritual practice. I think but, that's beautiful. You know, that, that, that's a very countercultural thing to do this day and age. It, it is so tempting, Miranda. I completely agree with what you say. Unlike you, I don't keep my phone on my charging device, but you may have inspired that. And it's interesting because it's, it is cocaine or heroin or anything. It's like you just want to grab it. That's your first habit is I always first thing in the morning, like you, I do pray, I meditate, I do inner child work, heart focused breathing to the one place where it gets me, where I don't normally look at anything, but I do like to use the notes section of my phone to write down what I'm grateful for. And I just realized, what if I could let that go 
And instead of writing it down in the notes section, I found, what if I could just journal the same way I'm journaling anyways and journal the 10 things I'm grateful for? So that's not the gut reaction of I'm awake, therefore I need my device, right? And the other thing on a practical level that any of us can do that I think everyone should do is turn everything that pings at you off. Yes, I have done so, that, Miranda. <laughs> so you choose like when you're going to respond to a text or a notification or how much input you're going to allow to come into you. Because if you don't create some boundaries, there won't be any. And what that does spiritually is quite a disaster because it means we're constantly being hooked and pulled out of presence. And so to nurture spiritual resilience, we need four things. We need to ground ourselves in grace and so that we can deepen our access to into our sense of being in and part of something loving, powerful, peaceful, clear, and wise. Mm-hmm. Right? That we need that foundation or we don't have a hope in hell. Then we need to look at flexibility. How do I be flexible with the winds of change? Not resist change, but how do I grow deeper and broader roots in the deeper ground of grace? And so that I can act a bit like a coconut tree does in a hurricane. I can be flexible with the winds of change, not uprooted. Because like it or not, these are times of immense change. And given what we know about climate change and so forth, there's going to be many more changes. I don't think things are going to stop being intense. They haven't so far. So we have to adapt and grow. And flexibility is key. So we need to be flexible and we need to challenge the places where we're rigid on any level where we're not open to look at things in a new way, look at ourselves in a new way, look at the way we're relating in a new way, open to new possibilities, and even open to new ways of nourishing ourselves spiritually than what we might have thought of before. Right? I notice for myself, what's optimal for me is to have my morning meditation time and then to go outside and do my exercise outside, which for me is hiking the hill behind where I live. And it's become a walking meditation. Of course, I'm moving my body, I'm sweating, I'm getting my cardio, that's all good. But when I go and exercise after meditating, it's a continuation of the meditation. It's just that I'm moving and breathing. And it's helping me to deepen in my sensed, embodied experience of the fact that I am part of everything and everything is part of me. And I notice since I have been doing it that way that I have naturally more care and love for nature and for the environment. And I notice it translating into caring and being more meticulous in how, in the choices that I make. Where am I buying my food? What am I empowering as I move through daily life? And what is the impact of my choices on the environment and on other people? It's really interesting just observing that. And I hadn't thought quite like that 10 years ago. I'm thinking about it naturally now in ways that I wouldn't have thought of that as part of my spiritual practice, but it is. You know? It's where we put our attention is where our energy goes. And so if we're putting our attention on our consciousness, on breathing, on meditating, on finding that inner stillness, and if we carry that through, when we carry that through, that becomes our new baseline. I remember years ago, one of my dear friends and teachers, Arthur, when we first started working together a decade ago, he used to call me bird breath. Because God, bird breath? Bird breath. God forbid, Miranda, or any of you, if you Google me from 10 years ago, I used to talk like this and I was breathing and I couldn't breathe and I wasn't present at all. And no. then when I started bringing my awareness to my breath, it allowed me to drop in. And even this whole time, as you've been speaking, Miranda, 
I have been seeing the words you say as you say them, seeing the words I say as I say them, and even doing this interview is a meditative practice. So when we bring our conscious awareness, as my friend Arthur would call it, to everything that we do, going for a walk, going for a hike, even picking up your phone could become a state of heightened awareness when we're responsive rather than reactive. I had noticed that years ago to your point about the notification mm -hmm. is I hated all the noises, the pings, the dings. Mm -hmm. My phone is 24 hours a day, seven days a week on silent and do not disturb. And every single notification is turned off. So that way I can proactively choose what, when, and who I would like to respond to things because right. otherwise it's like a text comes in, you're about to do a podcast, have a meeting, whatever it might be, spend time with your child or a family member or a loved one, and something comes in and it's like chicken little, the sky is falling. And we yeah. have a profound opportunity as human beings to deepen into the essence of who we are as you began today by sharing that so beautifully, Miranda by deepening into the grace and the inquiry. And just the same way we have a beautiful orchid, it's a miracle when an orchid blossoms more than once because it's like that tenderness, right? You get this beautiful flower and then the beauty of it might fall away at some point. Do you keep watering it? Do you keep nurturing it so that one day another beautiful blossom may open and we have one right now that's reopening a year later? And to me, that is like the essence of our soul. Can tend to it, nurture it, even when it's not bearing fruit or something that we might appreciate, can we still maintain that consistency and that grace of our practice? So yeah. I love this, Miranda. And I would love to know from you, was there anything I didn't get to ask you today? Anything or maybe a closing thought that you'd love to share before we share with our listeners and viewers where they can connect with you? Sure. My website, Miranda McPherson, which is spelled M-I-R-A-N-D-A-M-A-C-P-H-E-R-S-O-N.com, is basically a whole treasure trove of practices and teachings and offerings, and there's really a lot there. There's a whole, there's audio teachings, there's med meditations, there's courses, there's programs on meditation, on inquiry, on devotion, on so many things for people to gain access to is really a whole world there. So I hope that they will. And I hope if you like what I'm saying, I'd really encourage you to buy and read The Way of Grace, which is probably my most seminal book. But I would like to just say that we can practice in every moment. And that also includes the beautiful moments of life. So when, for example, we're just having a really sweet moment of laughter with a friend or your child or grandchild is doing something that just lights you up because it's so sweet, or you're down at the dog park and the dogs are doing something that crack you up. It, those moments also can be moments because when you consider these ordinary things of joy and pleasure as triggers, right? Your grandchild doing what it does, the dog doing something silly is like a trigger but the location of the experience of that joy and delight is your own heart. So if you turn the focus from the outside to the inside and you let your consciousness like just ride the energy but ride it inwards, you'll find that, wow, you start to see that your own heart is the source of what in the Vedas they called Ananda, which is love, joy, and bliss. And that your heart itself is an ocean of ananda. And so this isn't just a theory. Next time you're having a really sweet moment, consider that a moment of meditation also. And just open and soften and enter into the source of where that's coming from. And you may realize there's a much deeper font of life force and love and positivity for you than you imagined. So I've written about that in my book, The Way of Grace, that's under the chapter, The Joy of Being. And I just hope that those who've been listening today have found this meaningful and can take something away that helps them to become more grounded in grace and more spiritually resilient. Thank you so much, Miranda. To, e to you, to each of you watching, listening, whenever and wherever, 
we intend that there was a pearl of wisdom, that there was a moment of grace that maybe you were able to experience and cultivate it, whether it's those moments that you've enjoyed during the show or a moment after the show. See where we can apply this in our lives. Where can we allow the beauty in our hearts to unfurl, to be nourished, and may grace and inquiry be the water and the sunlight that allow us to achieve our highest potential as human beings and spiritually become resilient. I am Jennifer Cahill, and it's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.